All right, here we are. This is the all things Western deal that I'm doing. Um, everybody's calling it a podcast, and I thought like you had to officially do something in particular to make something a podcast. But evidently, if I just sit and talk to myself and then post it on the World Wide Web, that's a podcast. So doing the podcast thing, I need to come up with some kind of like Yahoo, rolling, rolling, rolling kind of a deal with them uh but i don't have one so anyway here's what's on my mind um there's two things actually which i was this sunday afternoon and just kind of hanging around the weather's too crappy to ride um and i was telling myself oh yeah i'll take the mic with me tomorrow and while i'm doing my chores i'll do this but it's really on my mind and so i i thought i'd just just talk about it while i'm thinking about it uh, so yesterday I was helping a friend move some cows. He had some cows out and they were terrorizing the countryside in the snap. He and I got them caught. And then we were just cruising around, trailering them here and there, and getting everything put back together where they were. And the conversation got on to, um, some guys that, that I know that, he had done some business with and this and that and they're no longer friends and and wasn't trying to be nosy I was just kind of curious because they're all guys I know and I'm I, I'm not good friends with any of them but friendly with all of them and, and I just kind of you know yeah what was the deal anyway where was the big fallout and what it really boiled down to is that um, the guy I was I was helping yesterday has has been really successful um you know he came from the same place all the rest of us did which was practically nothing and he's just been smart about what he does and been lucky to some extent um and and worked really hard and you know he's he's under 40 he, he's got 500 cows he owns these cows his cows are paid off he owns his uh, i don't think his place but i think all of his equipment all of his trucks and trailers are all paid for um, pays off his operating loan every year which those operating loans lots and lots and lots of ranchers don't pay off every year they they then get a bigger loan the next year to pay them off with um, you, you know most of the ranching industry is in hawk and and he's winning he's under 40 and and just about owns everything and so that's that's the place he's in and it's you know kind of a deal where some of these other guys we were we were talking about that we both knew and and he grew up with and i just know him they uh you know there's some jealousy and some stuff going on in there and he said he said shoot man you know i just i want to succeed but i want to see everybody succeed and i said yeah i'm i'm in the same boat that i i want to see everybody kicking ass and winning and whoever I'm around, I'm always trying to do whatever I can to, to get them in a better place because, um, you, you know, you, you, are, you are who you hang out with. You are, you are who your peers are. And so uh, I've always tried to put myself in a situation where I'm, I'm the least handy guy on the crew. I'm the least knowledgeable guy. I'm always trying to be around people that are better than me. Um, and you know with with the shame of tooting my own horn it's just I'm old enough and experienced enough now that the, that's actually pretty tough to do um, but but I'm, that's always what I'm searching for is because if everybody's better than me that that gives me the um, the drive to try to get better and then now as I'm getting older if, if I have a bunch of younger people around me well that also gives me a lot of drive to get better uh, by teaching them but he and I were on the on the same deal that yeah we we want to see everybody kick ass because that that just helps you kick ass even better and uh, and he he brought up a great point he's he said uh yeah I want to see everybody succeed because especially because the the generation before us they really didn't set us up for that very good we're we're in a you know we're, we're brought up in a in a way and in a place that 
but it's pretty hard to get ahead. And, and that brings me to my main point, but the, what he said is what got me to thinking about it. Um, because the generation below he and I, or, or younger than he and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm 40, he's almost 40, they're in an even tougher situation uh, because of of the way things have been set up. And so this bring comes into this supposed to be all things Western, and I use the I use the uh, fact that I came to this thought by helping another guy move cows. So there's there's the correlation to all things Western. But there's a deal that's viral on I guess TikTok now, and I'm not a TikToker, but I I saw the thing and, and saw the the uh, the repercussions of it and the and the blowback and the this and that um, and it's gone viral on TikTok and it's this little blonde haired gal and, and she's just pretty well in tears and, and she looks like she's in her in her mid twenties early twenties or mid twenties and she's talking about the fact that she works forty hours a week and and that's you know it comes out to two thousand dollars a month and her her rent is 16 something she's so she's got $300 a month to eat on and and when she's off of work she's just so drained she's just so tired that she can't get her can't do anything and it gets rolled over to the weekend and enough stuff gets rolled over to the weekend that it gets rolled over to both Saturday and Sunday and so the consequence is she never has a day off and and you know, at one point she's in tears and she says, I'm just not built for this and, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, and I think being it's gone viral, I think <laughs> if I saw it, I imagine everyone else has seen it because I'm, I'm not much of a internet guy to see these things. So I imagine everybody else has ever seen it. And, and the big deal is, so of course, the conservative side of the world, and I have no idea what the liberal side of the world is saying about it, but the conservative side of the world, without even having to watch anything, a guy knows they're saying, "By God, when I, you know, I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow and kill my lunch on the way, and work harder and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you work 40 hours a week. We, I used to work 300 hours a week when I was your age. Yada yada. You, you know what the the conservative pundits say." And so, on that front, uh, fiscally, I'm conservative. Uh, for everything else, I'm pretty darn libertarian, personally. Uh, you know, do whatever you want, as long as it's not harming me or mine. Um, uh, with a few exceptions that I, that I won't go into, because this isn't a political deal. But... Um, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican because, quite honestly, I think anybody that wants to be in the presidency, especially, maybe not so much in, in Congress or House of Representatives, but, but especially in the president, anybody that wants to be in the, in the presidency, in my opinion, is probably a son of a bitch and damn sure doesn't have my best interests in mind. Uh, if, you, if you just have the desire to be president, I'm suspicious of you. Um, and, uh, you know, anytime I get asked, I say, I say, well, I'm a monarchist and I've said that a few times and people say, monarchy, that's communism. I say, well, pay a little more attention to some of the other things I'll say, I say, and, and you'll figure out what I mean by monarchist. But, um, anyway, so that, that's my political views. And, and of course my first gut reaction was also because I'm fiscally conservative was just work harder you know no nobody ever cared that I was tired nobody ever cared that I was sad nobody ever cared that I was broke work harder um, but then I watched it a second time for some reason and it made me really really sad and and I still agree with my original reaction of, of work harder but the part that made me sad was was this poor girl, let's not worry about the fact that that she's not making enough money and she doesn't know what to do and, and this and that. Like, you know, 
I, I think we've all been broke before. We've all been poor. Like, like, that's understandable. That's part of life. That's a good thing to have happen in your 20s, I think. Um, that's why being in your 20s sucks because you have to go through that learning curve there. But what made me sad is that she obviously didn't have any resources at all in terms of and again like I say for, let's forget all about the money part but she didn't have any resources in the the understanding of herself and and the reason 40 hours of week of work makes you makes her so tired that when she gets home at night she just can't get herself to do anything well that's not because you're lazy that's not because you're bad that's not because you're this or that uh, you know it's there's a bunch of different reasons why it could be you know quite possibly you're you're just extremely introverted and and being around people that much is hard for you um, possibly it's because you you're dealing with depression and and just getting up and doing things when you're depressed and you don't know how to deal with that is literally hard work it's literally wears you out um, there, there's, there's all these things that, that this little gal, if you, if you watch the TikTok thing, doesn't have those resources. She doesn't know that about herself. She doesn't know that about, about the way the world works. And, and that's really sad to me that the, the way she was raised, she wasn't taught any of those things. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's really sad to me that she, she obviously doesn't have a community to be in to learn these things. Uh, you know, my first thing was, was, wow, what I'd what I'd really like to see you do instead of instead of uh, instead of making more money, I'd, I'd like to see you go to church. You know, I'd, if this little gal went to church, you know that then you start getting a support group you start getting uh you start learning that that there's there's somebody that loves you unconditionally um there's something out there for you and from there once you start building a community that's that's how you get ahead that's how you get a better job that pays better that's how you get a a roommate so you only have to pay half the rent that and on and on and on and on and on and you have people to help you deal with these problems that you have in your life um but and like so like i said that that was that was what made me so sad about it is this this little girl was was you know on the brink like obviously obviously suicide watch kind of stuff and and the poor thing she ends up getting famous for being a failure you know this thing went viral whatever whatever she was however bad she was feeling then she's now got got i don't know how that all works but like now she's got 10,000 10,000 comments on there from from right wing kids her same age that are are graduating from Harvard uh, that had all the benefits of everything in the world that are saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, like holy crap. Uh, but I, I really feel for the gal. Like, I, I hope... I hope that what, what she did doesn't kill her. Um, I really do. And, and, it's, and it's just because she doesn't have any, any resources at all to, to help her, to somebody to teach her. And obviously, nobody told her anything in the formative years and, and now she doesn't even know where to find it except to put herself out on the world wide web for the entirety of of the world to see that she is failing in life and doesn't know what to do with it that, that is that is just so deeply deeply sad to me um That's so sad to me. And, and so I, I talked about church for a second there, and I talked about um, being introverted for a second there. And so 
Um, I, I'm obviously a very introverted person. My my alleged uh, podcast is me sitting by myself in a Honda with the heater on because I don't even want to be in the house because there's people in there. But when I go to when I go to church on on Sunday today, when I go. Um, what I really want to do is the whole 45 minutes or so that everybody else goes in there and has a cup of coffee and talks to people and this and that and the other and then everybody goes and sits down and then there's four songs and then the preaching starts. What I really want to do is sit in the car and listen to the radio and sip on cold beers. And just the way I am, like, I, you can think whatever you think. I don't have a problem with sitting in the parking lot at church drinking beer before I go in. Doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't see anything that Jesus said that says you're not allowed to drink beer before church. Um, But anyway, that's what I want to do. What I do do, what I actually do instead of what I want to do, is I go in there, I get a cup of coffee, and I go as far away from the action as I possibly can and find a seat all by myself and I just sit there by myself. And what happens every single Sunday, I mean every single Sunday, somebody I don't know comes and says, hey, do you mind if I sit with you? And I say, no, go ahead, sit down. And I'm real deliberate about not starting the conversation. I just sit there quietly and have my coffee. And whoever that person is, sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman, um, been a couple times it's been a teenager sometimes it's somebody younger than me sometimes it's somebody older than me sometimes it's somebody a lot older than me um, they've got something they, they've got to say they've got something they, they need to get off their chest um, and I, I'll grant there's there's been a few times that an older gentleman has come and sat with me and after a few minutes of me saying nothing he said well son do you have something you need to get off your chest and I say no, sir, I, I'm, I'm in good shape. I'm just sitting here and drinking my coffee. And he realizes, oh, I'm, I'm, not, the, I'm not the lost soul he's, he's looking for. And so he goes on. But it's usually the lost soul comes and finds me, and they, they've just got something they've got to get off their chest. And sometimes it's not even that. They just, they just are a lonesome person, and they just need to talk to somebody. Um, you know, it's not always like there's a problem. Sometimes they just... I just need to talk to somebody. The, the guy today, um, yeah, he's Navy personnel. He's he's new, hasn't met anybody yet, and he just he was just lonesome. Just wanted to chat. Um, but that's that's what I do every Sunday before service starts. And there's been multiple multiple Sundays where me and whoever needed somebody to talk to didn't even go into the service. We just stayed, stayed out there outside the, outside the, uh, I don't know what you call the main part where the preaching goes on. There's a word for it, but I don't remember what it was. I'm not very churchy. But there's, there's been multiple times when, when me and whoever just sat out on the outside there and drank coffee and, and just talked. Um, you know, sometimes it's been a, several times it's been a bum off the street that was, slipping in there to get some get a free breakfast and and uh you know we talked about drug use and alcohol abuse and and this and that and and things going on and and you know there's a there's a plethora of these people that over the years of talking to them over church call me text me like all the time and uh you know sometimes it's just a howdy Sometimes it's, they need a pep talk, um, you know, sometimes they just need somebody to talk to, but that little gal on TikTok, there's, there's somebody like me in every church in America, every church in the world, there's somebody like me that, that really doesn't want to be there all that bad 
but goes goes anyway and uh, you know if that little gal would just would just go to church she would uh, she may be able to find somebody like me one of us that that's just there I'm, I'm here to give you a hand if you need it and so just dealing with the world and just <clears throat> going inside and outside of of the world and how it works and and you know especially the internet it, it's so easy to to watch some dipshittery on on youtube or tiktok or whatever and and make some snide comment uh, but it's a lot harder to to well wait a minute this poor little thing like hey, yeah I, I agree 40 hours a week well get a full-time job I agree but she doesn't know that and she doesn't understand how hard the world is obviously if, if you see the deal she just obviously doesn't understand how hard the world is but unfortunately she obviously doesn't understand how good the world is too how beautiful the world is how beautiful life is how beautiful friendship is and and how that all works and and what having a friend means is that when you're having that bad day you got somebody that loves you that's uh it was a sad story it was a sad story as far as I was concerned so what led me to to not wait till tomorrow in case I didn't have everything fresh in my mind about all this um, what was the next thing which is is really on the same theme the Elko Poetry Gathering I guess that's what they call it nowadays it was this last weekend and they uh, they do so much stuff there now I've, I've been I've never actually been to it I've been in Elko when they were having Poetry Gathering but that was in the wild eyed pistol waving days I never actually made it to the Poetry Gathering um, I made it to the bar and I stayed there but poetry gathering was going in and I know they do a lot more now than they did when I was bumming around that part of the world um, and a, a friend of mine from California he he went there too and he stopped and stayed the night at my house in Fallon on the way up six hours from his place to my place six hours from my place to Elko um, stayed the night on the way up Went up, elkoed around, and then stayed the night on his way home. And he mentioned that my friend Scott Van Leuven and his wife Andrea were on a panel. Uh, there was a five-person panel. The other person was a gal named Sagebrush Sarah, whom I know by reputation, but I don't know. And then the other two people on the panel I didn't know at all. Yeah, couldn't even tell you what their names were. But there was a five-person panel, and what they were talking about was the culture of alcoholism and drug abuse and depression and suicide and mental unwellness in the buckaroo, cowboy, cowpuncher, whatever, you name it, because... I've been I've been from one coast to the other and one border to the other and on several other countries doing this and it's it's the culture of of cowboys north and south no matter what they call themselves gauchos um, we're all the same there there's this culture of substance abuse there's a culture of um, depression there's a culture of of um, mental illness and whether whether you feel better about calling it mental wellness or mental unwellness or mental fitness or mental mental unfitness whatever um, substance abuse mental health and, and then ultimately suicide um, you know it's it's I don't know the difference between the word pandemic and endemic <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing 
laughing not at that that was an inappropriate time to laugh uh, like I said I'm I'm sitting outside in the car doing this because it's quiet out here the door just opened and a cat got flung out the door by its tail the only, the only person in the house is my seven-year-old son and there's one cat that is allowed in the house and another cat that's not allowed in the house and the cat that's not allowed in the house just got flung out by her tail which I reckon is the only way he could catch her so inappropriate time to laugh but I explain it anyway what I was saying is I don't know the difference between the words endemic and pandemic necessarily but but I know that that in the cowboy culture um, suicide is like this huge deal like every year we deal with it where one guy does it and then there's seven or eight more boom 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 that all knew each other that follow it, it, it's it's um it, it's kind of a death culture anyway cowboying is uh you, you know we're doing extremely dangerous work under duress for almost no pay under these ridiculously hard circumstances and uh, I'm gonna have to turn this off a second I had to pause there for a moment because I had a dog killing a chicken a dog killed the chicken and I had to go whip the dog and get rid of the dead chicken so here I am back on track where I was going with it and uh, it's unfortunate that that Maybe it's fortunate that that was unfortunate for the chicken and the dog, no matter what. Uh, but for the sake of the conversation, may or may not be fortunate. Maybe I was going off in too deep a rabbit hole, or maybe I lost my train of thought, but I'll, I'll kind of keep going with it. What I was saying was that, um, you know, the suicide rate is so high in the cowboy culture, um, you know, because it's it, it's such a ridiculously hard and dangerous job and the pay is low and one of the one of the major um, feathers in a guy's hat or, or accolades or, or what gets you notoriety amongst your peers is um, you, you know the the way a guy handles himself under pressure and, and these extremely dangerous situations that a guy got into and got himself out of and, and and so there's 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 this drive to to be that guy that rode that bronc that gathered that you know, roped that wild cow that um, you know did did these impossible things especially as as younger men and, and that's that's where the the suicide rate obviously is, is highest and it is in, in every um, every facet of the world it's, it's younger people and you, know, you get past 30 and it's a lot easier to not kill yourself I think but uh, <clears throat> in the cowboy world at least that that drive to be the guy that did that is um, you know it's so high that's how you get no notice that's how you get to be known as a hand that's how you get that's how you get to be one of the one of the guys um, and there's so much of that and and there's so so much to be the the guy that can drink a 30 pack and still drive home um, which is which is what what drives that alcoholism up there's there's you know and, and doing the crazy stuff you know roping a wild one off of a bronc you, you know you do it once or twice because you can you do it a third time to make yourself a little more famous by the fourth time you're scared of it and, and next thing you know you're you're using chemicals to to make it to where you're not scared um, and then on top of that you, you know the there's so much loneliness um, you're a weirdo anyway if you even want to do this I mean you're mentally already 
an oddity if you want to do this ridiculously hard and dangerous job uh, in bad weather a, a lot of times with with all of these things against you if you even want to do it you're you're mentally an, an odd person anyway and then you take that that odd person and, and you put them on a remote ranch somewhere uh, you know where you're by yourself all the time and uh, you know it's it's a it's a good recipe for for mental unwellness and, and the consequence is that the suicide rate is really high really high um, you know compared to other lines of work I, I don't know how to compare it I just I only know anecdotally uh, that all of us in this community couple of times a year and and the sad part is it's so common that that a couple of times a year when we hear so-and-so killed himself you go god dang that's too bad I really liked him you know and even if you were pretty close to him uh, and I keep saying him there's 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 not that you know there's truly just not that many women that are making a living as a cowboy so it's it's mostly young men um you know, but even if you were pretty close to the guy, we're so used to it, and that it shouldn't be like that. We're so used to it, where we're like, "Dang it!" And then if you're my age, you go, "Crap, who's next?" Because it, it always, it as soon as one does, there's always a couple others. And at my age, it's it's boys I don't even know, but I worked with their dad when I was a kid. Um, you know, and, and so then you hear, "Oh gosh, dang." Poor so and so's kid did did it, and and uh, it's so common that that we just we're used to it, and the same with with you know rolling pickups and, and kids killing themselves that way. You know, they they didn't, they didn't put a gun in their mouth, but they drank a thirty pack, and uh, then we're driving a hundred and four miles back to the ranch. It, at 98 miles an hour, there's seven of them in a single cab pickup, an old pickup, killed six of them. You know, every year you hear about that. And and every one of us has done that. Every one of us has done that. The, the guys my age just survived it. We were either the one that, the one that didn't get killed in that, in that wreck, or just the one that was lucky enough not to have that wreck, um, or both. In, in my case, it's both. Um, but that's the culture, you know. That's that's what we that's what we think we're supposed to do. It, it's it's not even a matter of wanting to do that. It's not that we don't know it's dangerous. It's not that we that we. we're trying to skate by at that age you know guys my age now yeah i may go if you know i guarantee you if i'd gone to if i'd gone to elko and gone to the outside circle and this and that you're damn right i'd have had too much to drink i'd have had too much to drink been stumbling around but i'd have either walked back to my camp or called a cab or i've got enough friends that somebody would have said hey brett let me give you a ride I, there's no possible way i would try to drive myself home anywhere in elko during the poetry wasn't gonna happen now that I'm 40 when I was 20 that was the plan you know that was the plan was was to have too much to drink and then see if I can make it home without getting caught or without getting killed um, I may have mentioned this on on this podcast before but I've mentioned it to a lot of a lot of people and a lot of people have seen it, a lot of people remember it, there was a lot of people that were there, but I made the front page of the Elko Star one year when I was 21 or two. Um, I was standing on a tray, a McDonald's tray, the trays that you get your food on at McDonald's, those plastic trays. I was standing on one of those trays, holding on to the tailgate of a pickup, smoking a cigarette with beer in my hand, 
um, doing 30, 40 miles an hour down Idaho Street, which is the main drag in Elko. And uh, when the cops whirled up behind me, I just, I let go with my the hand that was holding on the pickup and gave him the bird and skidded to a stop and, uh, you know, got thrown in jail and was famous for it. Like, it's that's still talked about today. That was the plan, was to do something so crazy that I'd get thrown in jail and everybody would talk about me. I, I mean, I, I'll admit to that. It sounds ridiculous to me now. Jesus, what in the hell were you thinking, Brett? Well, I, I was, you know, I was, I, in my mind, I was, I was becoming a legend. Well, that's so freaking stupid, but that's, like I say, that's the culture. That's the cowboy culture. That's... Those are the stories we tell around the campfire. Those are the things we laugh about. Those are the things that these young guys here, us older guys, talk about. Um, you know, those those young guys don't hear us older guys talking about um, the older guys that we know that we that we love and respect that went out of their way to, to show us something and um, had a wife and, and raised three kids and, and was financially smart enough to, to put enough away that that he bought his own little place and, and when he retired from cowboying at 65 or 70 he had a little place to go to and, and uh, now he sits out on the porch and plays pool those aren't the things we talk about often enough and so that's not what that's not what the younger generation is is trying to do they're trying to outwill James will James which I, that's a that's a catchphrase for me because that was that was my entire life up until I had children I was trying to outwill James will James what whatever will James had done other than drawing I, I knew I was bad at that, but like all the wild and crazy Will James stories, like I set myself up for that. I, I tried to do it, and I tried to do it bigger and better than Will James had done. Um, you know, so what's the consequence of that? Everything on me hurts all the time. You know, I've. I've I've broken everything. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely not wealthy by any means. I, I consider myself wealthy because I have a wonderful wife and three beautiful kids and roof over my head, enough to eat. But, uh, but fiscally, I'm not wealthy. Uh, you know, I, like I, I didn't gain a whole lot by that. All I gained was. You ask somebody that's that's cowboyed if they're if they're my age ish, even if they don't know me, they've heard of me. And oh yeah, that wild son of a gun, I, you know. And they, I've heard story. I've been in bars and heard people tell stories about me, and nobody knew that I was there because nobody there actually knew me. I've heard stories about things I've done, and like. It's not true. <laughs> like I've heard the story and be like, well, Brett Davis didn't actually shoot down a dragon with fireballs out of his eyes. You know, like however it went down, like, well, that's not how that really went down. Like the only part of that that's that's accurate was kind of the time and place. Um, you know, so but like so what? So what good did that do me? But that's that's what what all of these kids you see, these ranching kids you see nowadays are trying to do that same thing that I did is, is trying to create this this image of themselves and it's being the wild eyed pistol waver isn't a good thing it really isn't a good thing and the, the ones that have survived um, gave it up you know the ones that have survived quit drinking quit using drugs uh, got smart about what they were doing, started saving their money. Um, 
you know, and as, and as well as they could got, got mentally well. Um, I could, I could just throw out a list of names right now, guys from 80 years old to my age uh, of guys that have, that have made it, survived this life and, and, or are going to survive this life. I, I'm not going to, because without their permission, um, I don't really want to talk about them. It's all guys I know, and I, I, I'm sure they wouldn't care, but but I'm not going to do it. But there's guys I know also that are, they're only in their 50s, you know, mid-50s. There's guys, there's guys that are 10, 15 years older than me that didn't give it up, and um, they're not going to make it. They're, I, I ran into one here not that long ago. In the store, um, he's only tops. He's 17 years older than me. I, I guess he's probably only 15 years older than me. So it makes him, you know, somewhere between 55 and, you know, wait, he's not 60 yet. 55, 57, 58. Um, he's in a walker. He's in a walker. He had his mom holding his arm, helping him do his shopping. Um, and it, it's not some debilitating spinal disease he had or anything. It's not, it's not a, a you know, freak accident that, that, that hurt him. It was lots of accidents that could have been prevented that hurt him. It's lots and lots and lots of drinking that hurt him. It's, it's, it's that. Um, you know, if, if he gets another four or five years, um, you know, and I love the guy, he's a good friend of mine. I love him. Uh, anything I could do for him, um, I would, but he, he's somebody you can't do something for. He, he's, he's not going to take anybody's help. You know, if he's around another four or five years, I'd be surprised. And actually, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to be around anymore. So it's um, again back lead, back around to, to leading to suicide. Um, and this is, I realize this is deep shit for a for a podcast. You guys want to hear cowboy stories and and uh, you know great insight into horses and philosophy and stuff like that but um, that's what you get with podcasts you get whatever the hell I feel like talking about and and that's what I feel like talking about today is is this ridiculously destructive culture that we have built as a community um And to some extent, I know that a lot of people that that listen to that to this this deal, I know a lot of y'all are are uh, you know white collar professionals, and uh, you you can point examples. Well, that it's it's the same in the uh, oh, what you call people that draw buildings. For some reason or another, I think they're like the. The least likely to be self-destructive, uh, although I've read Anne Rand and Howard Rourke was self-destructive. Um, architects, there we go. That was a long way around to get to that. There's some of y'all that are that are architects or accountants. Accountants are another. For some reason, in my mind, accountants are are so dry that they they never have too much to drink. They never have any of these problems. I understand that in every every culture every community, every professional community, um, there's these same tendencies because those are human tendencies. Um, but, but I only know about this culture and about this community. And I, and I know that in this culture and community, it's been celebrated. Um, it's been 
it's been celebrated to be like that. I mean, for for heaven's sakes, Claude Dallas is a hero. Nothing against Claude. I've met Claude a couple times. Very nice, very nice man. Um, you know, the first time I met him, I thought I was going to be meeting Robin Hood, and, and turns out he was just a little old man. He's a nice man. But, you know, the fact that he he killed and butchered law enforcement and then was on the run for, I can't remember now, nine or 11 months, and then turned himself in and then escaped from prison, I think, three times, uh, that's celebrated in our community. Well, geez, that's, cr- that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Um, y- you know, there's, there's, there's songs written about him. You know, Ian Tyson's got, and, you know, I've got my own personal feelings about Ian. I've met him, too. You know, whatever. He's a communist. But uh, his music's big in this culture. And so there, there's little kids that have been celebrating Claude Dallas, you know, their whole life. They're 17, 18 years old, and they've been listening to what a hero Claude Dallas is because he shot a couple of game wardens since they were four or five years old. And, and you're just like, really? What? How is that a positive thing? Like, how, how do we make ourselves better that way? And if you want to get down to the the bare bones of it and the sticks and stones of it, um, you, you know the the major factor in in the agricultural community in general. This is this is not just cowboying. This is guys riding colts for a living and and horse trainers and and uh, sheep herders and and corn farmers. You know the the big thing is the pay. That's that's why people aren't staying in the industry. Well, how in the world are we going to change this from a job to an occupation? From a job to a career? How are we going to make that change when one of the biggest heroes in our industry is a murderer? That doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Um... So what do we do about it? I don't know. I, whoops. <laughs> there's, there's the part I forgot to to bring to the table here. Like, I'll show up with my bitching and my griping, but how do we fix it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, talk about it. You know, that's that's the first thing you got to do. Talk about it. Uh, it's something I talk about to the point where I think um, most of my friends in the community are sick to death about hearing about the fact that I've been suicidal on multiple occasions I, I think but but it's important to me I, you know I don't care if you guys are tired of this subject I, and most of them were there you know even when it was times like where it wasn't death by my own hand it was death by my own hand in a sense because I was the one that tried to bulldog a range steer off the off the running boards of a suburban I mean it's it all it all comes out the same other than the fact that it didn't um, so yeah I think most everybody like is uncomfortable with it they don't want to talk about it but I I want to talk about it I'm not afraid to talk about it um, because gosh dang if if there's some kid in Kansas that listens to this podcast and goes, holy shit, Brett's been on the edge and uh, walked away from it, you know, maybe he'll get some help. Um, you know, or if, or if somebody older hears this and, and knows somebody that's, that's uh, you know, showing all the signs of, alcoholism or or drug use or suicidal tendencies or just um, depression or, or just plain old desperation um, 
you know, maybe if I say something, somebody else will say something. I hope y'all do. Uh, you know, that's the old joke growing up. When I was a kid, at least, and maybe, maybe this, I imagine this was probably something a lot of people heard, but being around older older guys, I always had a good time being around old men. I always liked old men. You know, the old thing was always, well, yeah, I, I hope I, I hope I die because I was shot by a jealous husband crawling out of a window, which it, it, there were several years before I figured out what the hell that meant. Um. Uh, you know, and these were guys that had been married 52 years and had never even looked at another woman. But but the joke was, you know, kind of go out in flames kind of a thing. But um, nobody, ever, nobody ever said, that, you know, hope I die in my sleep like my dad did. My, my dad's still alive. That's just a... That's just a uh, example, but nobody ever said anything like that. It, it was it was always you tried to tried to make a big deal out of it, and and so you know then us kids we grow up hearing that, and, and that's what we try to do. We try to be our mentors, whether they were really being themselves or not. Um, So I, I think I'll wind this down, try to. I may get off on some other tangent. I think I'll try to wind this down. Going back to what I first talked about was the, the little gal on TikTok. Um, every one of us probably knows that person like like not her for a fact but but we know somebody like that that's that's in their in their 20s and they're in their first apartment and they're working their ass off and they don't understand how the world works and they can't figure out how to get a day off and, and they don't have a community around them they don't have um they don't have resources. I think everybody listening to that knows that person in, in one form or another. Whether it's somebody you actually know, and if it is, call them. Or whether it's somebody you see, and, and if you open your eyes, you'll you'll see her. You'll see that girl somewhere. Um, you know, maybe she's working the checkout stand at the grocery store. Maybe she's um, being at the local corner store where you buy your six pack every night. Uh, maybe maybe she's a he and, and he's working at the local car wash. Uh, that person's out there, and, and we see that person every day. And it's our job to find those people and identify those people and do something it could be just a smile a pat on the back a, hey you're doing a good job um, you could take a step further and, and and just from out of the blue write your phone number down and, and say uh, hey if you if you ever need somebody to talk to, don't be afraid to call me. And if you do that, don't be surprised that they do. I've done that. I've, I've really, truly done that to complete strangers that I, I could sense they were in in duress. They were, they were having a bad time in life and uh, shook their hand, introduced myself, passed them my phone number, and said, hey, if you ever need anything, give me a holler. And by golly, a lot of them will call you. And they don't, you can't help them. They don't, 
you can't do anything for them other than listen to them. But if you're brave, if you're brave, you'll do that. But those are the things we can do is identify those people that we know that are that are in that same boat that that poor little girl on TikTok is in. And we can offer ourselves up. We can do that. It's not much. It doesn't seem like much. It doesn't seem like much. Um, but I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that it is it it really is there's there's those people that I've called and it's it's always been somebody I knew pretty well um, and a lot of times I never even spoke about what was what was on my mind or on my chest, just somebody friendly to talk to. I, I'm telling you the truth, it's, it's more than you think it ever was. And then to go back even further to my, my friend that I was helping with the cows that I started all this out with is let's, let's try to see everybody win. Let's be the kind of people that it makes you glad to see somebody else kicking ass. Um, even if they're your competition, especially if they're your competition in, in whatever whatever you're doing, um, let's be the kind of people that that you're happy for them. And, and you'll go out of your way to tell them you're happy for them. And like I said, even if they're the competition you see that they need something that you got that you can help them with that you'll you'll say hey uh, I see you need a such and such x29 mitivator I happen to have one I'm not using it right now it'll sure help your business out be that kind of person because um, you know you look on everybody presents their their best everybody pre- shows their their best to the world um, nobody wants to show their ugly side nobody does uh, on social media of every sort we only show ourselves winning we only show ourselves at the beach with the perfect tan and the pretty girl on our arm uh, we, we don't we don't ever nobody posts pictures of themselves detoxing on their kitchen floor but in in some way or another we've all been in that spot Um, I hope for the sake of anybody that's listening you've never actually been detoxing on your kitchen floor I, I, I hope it was it was less severe than that uh, you know, but but the severity of a, of a situation only depends on the severity of the situations you've been in before. Um, to me, detox, detoxing on the kitchen floor is not that big of a deal. To somebody else, it's a huge deal. Well, the first time I ever did it, it was a huge deal too. Uh, so, but like I said, nobody shows that. Everybody. We only show our, our pretty side. We don't show our ugly side. But look out for that. Look out for for maybe there's a little bit of an ugly side here. And, and can I help this person? Can I be a little bit better to them? Can I, uh, instead of telling them to pull themselves up on their boot or by their bootstraps, can I uh, give them some advice? Can I offer them a smile or a hug can I invite them to church
and y'all see it every day. Everybody does. Everybody sees this every day. Everybody turns their back to it every day. Myself included. I, I'm not. I'm not a saint. Um, yeah, I pick up homeless people and feed them and, and do this and that and it, like I try because I've been there, but but there's times when I just I don't have it in me. Like I get it. Everybody's that way. There's times I don't have it in me, but there's times when I do. And and it's the same for for anybody that's listening. There's there's times when you do have it in you, um, and so do it. And I guess that's probably that's probably the spot to wrap this up. Um, if I was going to try to do anything else from here on, I'd I'd be forcing it, and I've already gotten pretty preachy. So. Uh, Stay safe. Love you guys. That last little deal I did was so dark, I thought I'd maybe throw in some light hardness here. This is for levity's sake. Uh, so, yeah, the first thing we were talking about was mental health and this and that. This is, this is stories from the Lost Boys. So, my wife and I, since literally before we were married have always had some kids around and when I say kids they were they were always in their their late teens and early 20s um, so I, I don't mean little kids but we have our own little kids but we've always had these kids around that uh, that that were they were troubled, they had shit going on, they didn't have parents, like, whatever. Like, we run the gamut. And they, they just end up, they're, they're just these sometimes homeless, sometimes not homeless kids, but kids without any anybody to help them or any future, and they end up with us. They end up either living with us or practically living with us, and uh, they spend a couple of years, and, and we do what we can to, to, to help them mature and grow and blah 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 and they end up becoming family and and we we think of she and I think of every one of them as our own children and honestly the the first handful of them are are old enough that like biologically could not be our children but we still think of them as our children um we call them our kids and and I think a lot of them think of us as parents you know they they think of our children as their siblings um, they become family, and it's a wonderful part of life. And so I call them the Lost Boys. My, uh, you know, I'm Peter Pan. Amy evidently is Tinkerbell, and uh, we've got all the Lost Boys. And even though not all of them are boys, some of them are girls. I still call them the Lost Boys because it just works better, fits fits into my mind better. So anyway, our latest one. And I'm not going to divulge his name or where he's from or anything like that. Um, but he's he was 19 when he first showed up in our life. He just turned 20 the other day. And he's he showed up in our life. And uh, he's, he's a hoot. He's a really, he's a good kid and a funny kid. Um, and he's a really smart kid. He speaks six languages. He's really good at math. He can build computers. Uh, he wants to be in the horse industry, and, and I can tell him something, and and doesn't take him very long. He can figure it out and start applying it, and, and have it pretty well um, figured out in in a couple of days. He's a really smart kid, but he's 20, so he's a complete idiot, and and that is understandable. I was 20 once. I I get it. I was 20. So. The, the only other thing that, that just kind of helps to understand the funniness of this is that almost, I don't know, I won't say almost, but I think every other one of the Lost Boys have been like 
tough kids, like almost street kids. It's almost all Aggie kids, but but kind of the street kid mentality where they kind of raised themselves to to a point, and they came from a family situation where they didn't have a lot of family, and so like they were tough, and they had a had a shield over them, and and uh, knew how to take care of themselves and this and that, and and so you know most of most of the influence that my wife and I have had on them has been like learning how to how to be with yourself like learning how to be okay with who you are this kid uh is pretty darn privileged uh like really really privileged came from came from a, a relatively wealthy family uh learned how to work and worked hard and everything like that but but like it was it was always there it was always there for him everything he needed um Never had to do the pull himself up by his bootstrap steel. Uh, went to a private school, took tennis lessons, blah, 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 blah. But a super good kid, super sweet kid. But just doesn't quite understand how privileged he's been. And so now he's, he's now 20, just turned 20. So now he's 19, 20 years old. He's out on his own. He's a jillion miles from home. He doesn't know anybody where he's at. It's kind of his first job, not working for his folks. And, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> and so that's where he's at. He's not working for me, but uh, but he's working for a good friend of mine. And so that that's where he's at, and he just kind of doesn't really understand the world, and, and he doesn't he, he doesn't have a car, so he, he's got to hitch a ride everywhere, and, and he doesn't understand things like, um, asking, you know, he says th- things like, well, I'm, I'm ready to go home now. Well, that's nice. I'm not ready to take you home yet. <laughs> you know, just things like that. And, and there, there is a, la- a language barrier, uh, a cultural, a cultural barrier and language barrier there. Um, so anyway, back to what the, the whole point of the story. So every Friday, I pick him up. Friday evening, Friday afternoon, I pick him up. He lives in a in a a really nice camp trailer in a uh, camp trailer place. I don't know what you call those places. You know what I'm talking about. That his employer bought for him or bought and has for him, and they pay the rent and everything. And um, so he lives in a really nice camp trailer. And so I pick him up Friday evening. And he spends Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night with us, and then part of Sunday day, and then we give him a ride home. And he goes back to work Monday, and he, um, I'm not really sure how he goes to, gets to work. His employer picks him up, or somebody picks him up. I don't know how in the hell he gets to work. But, so I pick him up every Friday evening. So Friday evening, I go pick him up, and first thing we do is we go grocery shopping. And he's getting pretty good now, but for quite a little while there, I had to, well, I still go with him, but for quite a little while there, I had to kind of hold his hand buying groceries and, and explain to him how to how to buy groceries and know that, that, that here's how you price things and here's the difference in quality and the, this and that and the other. And that's, you know, that's partially a, a, a privileged kid, but on the other hand, I, like I said, I was 20 once. I didn't know how to buy groceries either. So just helping him out. So last Friday, this Sunday that I'm talking, so not Friday a couple days ago, but Friday a week ago, I picked him up, went and got his groceries, and I went with him, and I bought a quarter, half, and half. And then we uh, then we go to his house, put his groceries away, and then we go to my house, and, and he spends the weekend with us. And he even asked me why I was buying a quarter, half, and half. Um, so anyway, he he noticed the fact that I was buying half and half and, and questioned it because no one in my house drinks milk or uses half and half. And I said, well, because you're coming over for the weekend and you put sugar and half and half in your coffee, which I think is... A, definite sign that you're leaning towards communism but that's just my opinion and he said oh okay 
And so we put his groceries away. We went to the house. He spent the weekend. Had coffee with sugar and half and half in it. A week goes by. I picked him up on Friday. Went and got his groceries. Took him to his house. Came to our house. Saturday morning, he gets up. Finds the sugar. Finds the coffee. Finds the sugar. Finds the half and half. Has his coffee. This morning... He goes and pours himself a cup of coffee and then is wandering around the kitchen, opening up every single drawer and every single cabinet and every single everything, looking for the sugar, which is in the same place he found it yesterday. And he used it and put it away. And finally he asked me, he says, where's the sugar? And I said, well, how the hell would I know? I know where the sugar is, but I said, how the hell would I know where the sugar is? And he says, you don't know where the sugar is in your own house? And I said, I don't use sugar. Why would I know where the sugar is? So eventually he finds the sugar. And then he's looking for the half and half. And he looks in the fridge, and it's not there. Or he doesn't see it. And then he starts looking through every cabinet and every drawer. And finally he says, are we out of cream? And I said, how would I know? I don't use cream. And he says, in your own house, you don't know where the cream is? And I said, what? why would I know where the cream is? I don't know where the cream is. And so he looks in every cabinet and every drawer again. Why he's looking in the cabinets, I don't know. And then finally looks in the refrigerator again and then declares, we're out of cream. And sits down to have his coffee with just sugar. And I'm on the verge of rage and frustration and hilarity at the same time. Because he's the only one that uses cream. He was there when I bought it a week ago. He used it the week before. He used it the day before. He's the only one that uses cream. The cream is wherever he put the cream. Uh, so anyway, I let him take a couple sips out of his coffee. And then I get up and walk over and I open the door and grab the cream and put it on the kitchen table. He says, how did you find that? And I said, it says cream, right? It says half and half right on it. You're the only one here. You you used it yesterday. You're the one that put it back. How did you not know where that was? Um, anyway, ha, ha, ha. Like I said, I was 20 once and couldn't see because a different part of my anatomy was doing all the thinking. But uh, that's just, it's just funny for my team. <laughs>